Ladies and gentlemen, joining us now is a man that revolutionized the mafia. He was known as the Yuppie Don. He was a part of the Colombo family. He has changed his life around completely. Now he's a coach and a good one at that. This coming December, this month, he is launching two websites that you can check him out. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the most exciting conversations I've looked forward to in a long time. I heard this man speak when I was in college at West Virginia. We went and heard him talk. We weren't allowed to, we weren't told who was talking to us. And it was an hour long motivational speech. It was captivating. Ladies and gentlemen, joining us now, Michael Francis. How are you? Thanks a lot, Pat. I didn't realize that, uh, did I meet you in West Virginia at that time? Oh yeah, I shook your hand. I'm from Pittsburgh where a lot of you Italians roam. So I was excited to chat with you, man. Oh, that's cool, man. Yeah, there's a lot of us down there for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Got a couple of them in the room right now. Okay, so let's lead off with your story. Uh, you were born and raised in Brooklyn, and you were basically your dad was a member of the mafia, if I have that correct. That's correct. My dad was the underboss of the Colombo family back in the 60s. Okay, so I watched The Irishman just yesterday, and I feel like I've gotten refreshed on the entire mafia thing. What was life like growing up with a dad that was an underboss in a mafia family? Well, you know, it wasn't only that he was the underboss, Pat. For some reason, my dad was probably the highest profile figure of his time. You know, he got a lot of attention. He was constantly under investigation, always a major target of law enforcement. So I grew up around, you know, FBI and law enforcement basically shadowing my father 24 seven. So, I mean, I grew up hating the police for that reason because they were always there and I got into many, you know, hassles with them and, and arguments and so on and so forth. So it was strange, you know, I love my dad. He was a great father. So I always looked at law enforcement at that time as the enemy. So I grew up with that kind of thinking, you know, early on in my life. And I think if I recall right from your story you told us at West Virginia, you weren't planning on going into the family business. And then one time you visited your dad in jail and told him basically you were going to get in there to help him get out. Am I accurate in saying that? Yeah, what happened? I mean, I was a pre-med student and I was an athlete. I played ball at Hofstra University. And my dad drew a 50-year uh, prison sentence from allegedly masterminding a nationwide string of bank robberies. He supposedly ordered this whole string of robberies. And uh, at the time, Joe Colombo, you know, was the boss of our family. I got very close with him, met a lot of my dad's friends. And, uh, you know, they told me, what are you doing going to school? If you don't help your father out, he's going to die in prison because he was 50 when he went in. So I go to see him in, in uh, the visiting room, and we're sitting down there in Leavenworth. And I said, Dad, you know, what's the deal with this bank robbery? And he swore up and down. He said, son, I was framed. I'm not a bank robber. And we got to work to try to get this uh, conviction overturned. And that's what just turned my whole head around. And I said, okay, then, you know, I got to leave school and try to help you out. And that's when he basically proposed me for membership in the family because he said that if you're going to be on the street, I want you on the street the right way. In his mind, the right way was to become a member of his life. So he proposed me for membership at that point. In jail, you got proposed a membership of the mafia? Well, when I say proposed, he had to send word downtown, you know, to the family leadership down there and say, I'm proposing my son. And at that point in time, I sat with, uh, who was the boss of our family at that time, the acting boss, Tom DeBella, he's passed on now. Because, you know, Joe Colombo had been shot and seriously wounded at that uh, big rally that we had, the Italian-American Civil Rights Day at Columbus Circle. So Tom ran it down for me. He said, you know, your father's proposing you for this life. And um, from now on, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you're on call to serve the Colombo family. That means if your mother is sick and dying, we call you to service. You leave your mother. You come and serve us from now on. We're number one in your life before anything and everything. So at, at uh, 22 years old, I was recruited at that point in time, and that's when it started for me. What are some of the jobs you do as a young guy trying to earn your way into the family, just getting into the mafia? You know, Pat, basically you got to do what you're told. I mean, you know, look, I'm, I'm always honest with the audience. They say that, you know, in order to make your bones, so to speak, you know, you got to be involved in a murder. you got to kill somebody. And, um, you know, you're basically on call to do whatever you're told to do. And I had to be in Brooklyn, you know, seven days a week almost. And I was kind of at the beck and call of my boss and uh, my captain at the time. And, uh, you know, at the same time, I'm an earner, so I'm trying to earn a living, trying to impress them, show them that I can, uh, I can, you know, bring money into the family. So I was kind of doing everything, you know, and then just leading up to the night when I would be called in to, uh, you know, to be formally made. 
And uh, for me, that happened on Halloween night, 1975. I was I was made with uh, five other guys at that time. Is that like in the movies? I think in Goodfellas, there's like a candle that's burned, and it's in your hand, and the whole thing. Where from now on, you're reborn, basically, you're a made man. Is that how it goes in real life as well? Yeah, it's it's a very solemn ceremony. You know the way we did it. There was six of us that night, and it was at uh, Anthony Colombo. Joey's son had a uh, catering hall in Brooklyn. And that's where we held the service because obviously you don't want the law around, so it's got to be very covert. And uh, the six of us walked in individually. The boss was seated at the head of like a horseshoe configuration. The underboss in the consigliere, which is an official position, with his left and right, and all of our capos or captains were alongside of them. So I walked down the aisle, stood in front of the boss, held out my hand. He took a knife and cut my finger. Uh, some blood dropped on the floor. This is a blood oath. And then I cupped my hands. He took a picture of a saint, Catholic altar card, put it in my hands and lit it aflame. And it didn't burn. I heard it. You know, it burned quickly. It was merely symbolic. And he said, tonight, Michael Francis, you are born again into a new life, La Cosa Nostra. Violate what you would know about this life, betray your oath, and you'll die and burn in hell like the saint is burning in your hands. And he said, do you accept? And I said, yes, I do. And that's the oath. That's how it goes. Oh, my God. <laughs> That what a wild scene that is! I'm mean, you got. I'm sure you at this point can fathom the people from outside looking in in the mafia world. It's so intriguing that this existed in America. And after watching The Irishman, by the way, you you mafia folks had your hands in everything in the history of America. Well, you know we did, and and you know it's what I tell people is that you know we survived and prospered for well over a hundred years in this country, and the reason for that is because. We, we infiltrated society, you know, from the guy on the street in the numbers business right up to the White House and everything in between. I mean, we controlled the unions. We had, uh, you know, a lot of politicians that we, we had strong influence over. And, uh, you know, you control the unions in this country. You basically control the country. And at one point in time, between the Teamsters and, uh, you know, the, uh, the waiters and bartenders and, uh, you know, and everything at the docks, I mean, we really had it sewn up. So... You know, for a period of time in this country, I always say, Pat, the, the golden era of the mob in America, and especially in New York, was really from the 50s right through the mid-80s when Giuliani started to go crazy with the racketeering laws. But during that, you know, 40-year period, or so 30-year period, rather, we really controlled uh, a lot of what was going on in this country. How do you control a union? Yeah, how's that happen? Because we watched Hoffa. We in the Irishman, you got Hoffa in the mob. In the mob, we're getting into it, right? That was ultimately mm -hmm. the demise of Hoffa. How do you control the unions? You just get in top with the the president and the people on top of that. Yeah, I mean, you install your people there, you know. And Hoffa, to a great degree, he owed a lot of what he had, you know, to to guys like us. And by the way, let me let me just comment on the Irishman. I thought it was a good movie. I really did. You know, those performances by, by those guys were always great. I thought Pacino, Pacino kind of stole the show. Uh, but I will tell you this. Um, it was total fabrication. Whoa! Oh, oh, oh. oh. <laughs> No, Pat, uh, Sheerhan did not kill Hoffa. He's been discredited so many times, and I know that for a fact. And he absolutely did not kill Joey Gallo. I mean, that was right in my time, my family. And, you know, I obviously knew what was going on back then. We almost went to war over that. Uh, and I was recruit at the time, but I was intimately involved in what was going on there. And the shooters for Gallo were known. I mean, this guy just made it up. I mean, he, he absolutely made it up. Uh, aside from that, the movie was good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, how, how can Scorsese and that cast make a bad film? Right. That's true. But uh, I will tell you this. I was really surprised with Pesci's performance because... I knew Russ Buffalino very well. He was very close with our family. I knew him well. And, um, you know, he did a good job because Russ was that kind of low-key kind of guy. Uh, he wasn't as powerful as they portrayed him to be in the movie, but, um, you know, it, it was a good job. And in fact, Tony Salerno, the boss of the Genovese family, I was pretty close with Tony. We had a couple of, you know, good uh, uh, relationships, I would say, in business. And uh, I thought that Dominic played him very well, too. It was a good job. Who was Again, the most... The movie was a fabrication. Remember that. <sighs> That's heartbreaking. I've literally been, I, I just said this morning on my radio show that it felt like I was taking a walk through American history class. <laughs> <laughs> Turns out it was all bullshit. That's a little bit upsetting to me. But who was the most powerful person at one particular time, like in the history of the mob, you think? Well, during my era, 
uh, really the most powerful guy was, uh, <clears throat> you, you probably know him, Vincent Giganti. They called him the chin. He was the real boss of the Genovese family. Uh, Tony Salerno was kind of, you know, because Chin would stay very low key and he put on that, you know, crazy act and all of that. Uh, Tony kind of ran things. But Chin was really the powerhouse, you know, in uh, 70s, 80s, you know, during my era, for sure. Okay, so you he, he was very powerful. You said earlier that you were an earner. And I remember listening to you tell your story about the gasoline racket that you ran. And I was like, oh, my God, this guy is a genius. How old were you whenever you started becoming like the number one earner for the mob, basically? And can you explain the gasoline racket that you started and how you thought of that idea? Yeah, basically, I was in my 20s. You know, I, I was fortunate, Pat, that I had a head for business and I knew how to use that life to benefit me in business. And, you know, just a quick thing, I, mean, I had a lot of legitimate businesses going on. I had two automobile dealerships. I had a leasing company. I had a lot of stuff that I had, I had put together. But, you know, the real um, score, I would call it for me, was the gasoline business. And basically, there was a guy out east in Long Island that had a small gasoline operation. He had a, a company. And two guys from another family were extorting him. They were trying to get involved in his business. So he ran to me. I was kind of the guy on Long Island uh, for help. And basically, he told me that, you know, he had a germ of an idea on how maybe to defraud the government out of tax on, on every gallon of gasoline. Now, you got to understand, I hated the government at that point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. And, you know, you know my, my targets, I was never, uh, my targets were always big. I mean, if I went after anybody financially, I would go after an insurance company, a bank, because they got all the money and they don't feel it. And of course, the government. Right. So this was right up my alley. So I said, all right, we'll, we'll, we'll try. Let's see what this, uh, what this is all about. So I got rid of the two guys who were bothering him. I mean, I made them go away. I didn't get rid of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. I got I to gotta be careful how I talk. But uh, <laughs> made those guys go away. And um, so I had this guy around me. Pat, listen to this. A guy around me, his name was Vinny. Big guy, right? And uh, he had a, a scar across the top of his head. He was really a, you know, a scary-looking guy. And he was my butcher. He was a butcher. So every Saturday, he would bring me meat, right? So this particular time, I put this Vinny next to this guy, Larry, his name was, who had the gas operation. I said, watch this guy. Let's see if he's really on to something. So about two weeks later, you know, we started a new company, opened up an office. Two weeks later, he comes to me on a Saturday, and he's got this box on his shoulder. So I opened the door, and I said, hey, what are you doing with all this meat? What are we having, a party? I don't know about it. He said to me, no, chief, it ain't meat. Come in the kitchen. So we go in the kitchen, he puts the box down on a table, opens it up, and he said, this is the first week's take in the gas business was $320,000. Hello! <laughs> yeah. Smelled like gasoline. Smelled up the whole house. I didn't care, right? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, so he really caught my attention, and we grew that 320 over a seven, eight-year period to, you know, between 8 and $10 million a week that we we're bringing in. You know, and I had... I had over 350 gas stations I either owned or operated. And then I had 18 companies that were licensed to collect tax on every gallon of gasoline. So we really had it going on for quite some time. You know, I recruited the Russians from Brighton Beach. They were my partners. They had a number of uh, br unbranded stations at that point. So we had a pretty big operation up and down the East Coast. I assume whenever you're bringing in that much money for the family, you become quite a hot commodity for the mafia, I'd assume. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, when I realized what I had, I went to see my boss, who was Carmine Persico at the time. He passed away earlier this year. And I said, Junior, I called him Junior. I said, Junior, I'm going to show you more money than you ever saw in your life. So immediately looked at me. He said, oh, we don't deal with drugs. I said, Junior, it's not drugs. I hate drugs. We didn't do anything with drugs. I said, it's gas. I said, but here's what's going to happen. As soon as the rest of the families know about it, everybody's going to want to get involved. You can't let that happen because we'll blow it. I said, so every time I have an argument, every time tries to, somebody tries to get involved with me, I got to win. No politics, no nothing. You got to stand behind me. And if you do that, I said, I'm going to make you a wealthy guy. Well, at the height of my operation, I'm bringing in $2 million a week into the family. That buys a lot of loyalty, Pat. So I mean, <laughs> seven, eight years. Yeah, I never lost an argument. I never had, even with Gotti and all these guys that tried to get involved, I never lost because... You know, that's the golden goose at that point. Nobody's going to let that go away. How did that end up getting stopped? Was that what ultimately your demise, or did you have to pull out of it because of sketchy situations? No, my partner, the guy that I started with, and listen to this, Pat. He was six foot five, uh, 500, almost 500 pounds when he was really heavy. 
but he always wears between 460 and 500 pounds, right? A big guy. And he wasn't a sloppy fat. I mean, he was just a big, solid guy. Anyway, he gets himself in trouble on another case. He gets indicted. And in the middle of his trial, he comes to me. You know, we had a jet plane, a helicopter. We had a compound in, in uh, Panama. We were actually paying off Noriega at the time. And, um, <laughs> and he says to me, he says, hey, chief, I'm leaving. He says, I'm not going to stay. I'm not going to do time. Look at me. I'm so big. I can't even fit on a cotton prison. So he takes off to Panama. And he's helping run the operation from there. Well, what happens, there was no extradition from Panama at that time to the United States. But you know what happened? The feds went in there in the middle of the night and they kidnapped him and they brought him back to Florida. And as soon as they got him here, they said, you know, you're going to spend the rest of your life in prison unless you tell us everything you know about Michael. And he became an informant at that time and kind of blew the whole gas thing up. So I ended up taking a plea to a big case as a result of his uh, cooperating. So the, if I recall correctly, you came and spoke at WVU to talk about sports gambling and stuff like that. Did you ever have your hand in that or did you just know of others that were doing that in the mafia world? No, Pat, I had my hand in it because I had a number of bookmakers that were working for me. You know, any bookmaker that <clears throat> can carry a decent bet, uh, bet somehow is gonna be uh, involved with us. Because, you know, they had collection problems, so we helped them collect, obviously. And if they needed money, we would lend it to them. So bookmakers operated under our control. So I had a bunch of them working for me. And we had a lot of athletes gambling with us at the time. So, you know, I was involved like that. If an athlete couldn't pay or somebody involved with the league couldn't pay, you know, they'd bring him in to me and we work out a situation where they either compromise the outcome of a game or they go get the money someplace and they pay us back. So... One way or the other, they had to do it. How often did that happen? And has all the stories of that happening come out? You know, all the stories do not come out, for sure. Um, and I don't, want to, I don't want people to think, you know, that every game is fixed when they see something wrong, either with a referee or, or, or somebody, you know, doesn't make a good play. But, you know, back in my day, it, it happened quite often, Pat. It really did. Wow. I mean, you know... You know, athletes had a tendency to gamble and they got themselves in trouble. And, you know, on the pro level today, it's less of a problem because these guys are making so much money. They can cover their bets. You know, it's more restricted to college right now is, you know, as you know, some of these young guys can get themselves in trouble and and they have no way to pay off a debt. But uh, it happens more than you think. Uh, I, I can tell people that. As sports gambling has become legal now, and it's getting, do you think that's going to help the problem or hurt the problem more? Quarterback in uh, Arizona Cardinals there, he's on the IR, so he's not really with the team. He just got caught up in a gambling situation. It was legal, they say, uh, or it was legal because he went through Caesars, but do you think this is going to help with that problem or hurt with that problem because guys are going to go elsewhere to gamble? You know, I think it's going to hurt because, you know, the more access you have to, to gambling, and, you know, athletes have a tendency to gamble, you know, and I understand it. It's kind of a, you know, an extension of their competitiveness. You know, I mean, I like to, I enjoy watching a game if I have a few bucks on it more. You know, it's just, it's natural. It's stuff like that. And then, of course, if you're an athlete, you think, you you know, you, you know the outcome a little bit better than somebody else, you know, sometimes. But, you know, I think the more access you have, the, the easier it is for somebody to get hooked on gambling. And, Pat, the problem is, it's, you know, it's a silent addiction. At, you know, it kind of sneaks up on you. Every guy that I knew that ever had a gambling problem told me they can kick the problem whenever they want, and they never could. And every single one, Pat, across the board, they all believe, ah, it's not a big deal. I can stop whenever I want to. It's, it, it's not easy. Trust me. I'm, it's a very intriguing time in sports with the legalization of sports gambling because for a long time it was something that was obviously done behind the shadows and illegally and things like that now that it's becoming legal but it's not i mean it's just going to be a very interesting time for sports to handle the whole situation I, how do you think the league should handle it well you know it's very difficult i mean i've been to this year i've been to a lot more schools because of the supreme court decision you know i'm talking to a lot more guys um and i got a i got a pretty good calendar next year with schools and i and I keep doing this because I, I feel like, you know, the guys pay attention. And if you can help one or two guys from getting themselves in trouble, it's big. Because, you know, one guy can take a program down. You know that. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, you know, the league just has – it's more education than anything else. I mean, education and then, unfortunately, enforcement if somebody does go down the wrong road. But education is important. These people have to – young people have to understand that gambling could be addictive – and uh, before you know it, you can be in there over your head and there's guys out on the street. It doesn't have to be a mob guy. 
you know, gamblers themselves. I mean, these are desperate people. Any way they can look to get an edge in any kind of sporting event, they'll do it. And they have to be mindful of that. So they got to watch, you know, the people that they're around. And they got to understand that, you know, through education, that this could be a real problem for them. You've and been that's what I stress. You've been removed from the mafia. You turned your life around. You've really become this outstanding citizen, which you can check out at michaelfrancis.com and also wiseguyswisdom.com, which is a new coaching site that's coming out. You've become this incredible citizen, right? Is the mafia still around? And do you ever have any fear with how you've come out and told stories about it? I've seen enough movies where it seems like if anybody talks about it, they end up as a dead man. You have gone on and told these incredible stories about your life. Does the mafia still exist as much as it did back in the day or at all? And are you ever fearful of your life? Well, let, let's put it this way. It absolutely does exist. There's still five families in New York. There's still you know, a big presence in Chicago, Kansas City, places like that. Um, but it's not what it was at one time. It's different. You know, it's not going to go away in my lifetime. That's for sure. But, you know, Pat, what happened with me, you know, I'm going to be honest with you. You know, number one, I never put anybody in prison. I didn't cooperate with the government in that regard. I played a game with the government where I made them think I was cooperating. But at the end of the day, I didn't cooperate. You know, it was just my way of doing things. And I, I got in trouble for it. I mean, they put me back in prison as a result when they realized what I was doing. But How'd, you do that? How'd you do that? Prison. How'd you do that? Well, you know, just making them think. I mean, I talked to them, make them think I was going along. But when they wanted me to testify, I refused. And, you know, it was a whole big <laughs> rough time in my life, you know. So, I mean, I never hurt anybody in, in that regard. And, you know, the thing that happened, Pat, everybody that I ran with, everybody is either dead or in prison for the rest of their lives. You know, Fortune magazine had a big article back in 86. It was the 50 biggest and most powerful mob bosses in the country. And they, they featured six guys. I was one of the six they featured. It was a huge article. It was like half the magazine. But they actually had a chart with the 50 of us on there, according to rank and wealth and power. They had me down as number 18. I was the youngest guy on the list. I was five behind Gotti at the time. Uh, Gotti hadn't been made boss yet. But that's not important. It's a silly list. I mean, I always say, how did they make? They didn't ask for our tax returns. I don't know how they did <laughs> You know, but it sold a lot of magazines. But here's the thing that's, that's fascinating and that, you know, that keeps me aware of how fortunate and how blessed I am. Out of the list of 50, 33 years later, 49 are dead. Jeez. 49 are dead. And I'm the only one that survived. So... When you look at that, you say, well, man, how did that happen? Well, obviously, I'm a person of faith, so I believe God had a different purpose for me. But, you know, aside from that, you know, when I left that life, one of the horrors of that life, Pat, and unfortunately, I witnessed this during my time, you can make a mistake. Your best friend picks you up, walks you into a room. You don't walk out again. That's it. You know, you're gone. And, and when I left the life, I said, okay, they're going to have to work to get me. They're not walking me in a room. So I moved to California, 3,000 miles away. I changed my whole lifestyle. What do I mean by that? I, you know, I didn't walk my dog every morning at 7 a.m. I don't create patterns in my life. I didn't go to the same restaurant every Tuesday night. So if somebody was scoping me out, they know where I am. I stayed out of clubs. You know, clubs used to be my life. I was six nights a week in a club. That's, that's how I live. But bad place for me because, you know, I know who hangs out in there. Somebody recognizes me. They make a call to New York. They want to be a hero. I walk out in the parking lot. Boom, I'm gone. So, I mean, I did all of that. I was very disciplined in that way. And then over a period of time, I just outlasted everybody. I, I mean, that's the bottom line. And, you know, they don't have an axe to grind with me right now. I mean, I can't go back to Brooklyn and say, hey, guys, I'm moving back into the neighborhood. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, I believe in God, but God doesn't tell you to be stupid. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I mean, uh, and I, I just been very fortunate, very, very, very fortunate. I don't know how other way to put it, because honestly, Pat, I don't know of anybody that reached the level that I reached publicly walked away from that life and lived to tell about it. I really don't. Yeah, I, that's why I was whenever you were talking to us at West Virginia, I think the first thing I said was. This guy's got to be full of shit. There's no <laughs> way this guy's done all this. He's still alive. And here we are years later. You're still thriving, still doing great things in the community. And, hey, I want to let you know from all of us over here, hey, we're happy for hey, you. Hey. hey. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. What does the mafia do now? 
Everything's everything is being watched. There's cameras everywhere. Not not that you're still connected at all. I, I'm not saying that. I assume that you get whispers though of what they're going. What do, what does the mafia do now? And what do they have their hands in? Anything? Well, let me tell you this. I don't know if you know this, but my dad was released from prison. He did 40 years on that 50 year sentence. He was in and out five times on parole violations. But he was released in 2017 at the age of 100. He was the oldest inmate in the in the country at the time of his release. My dad will be 103 in February. Holy shit! Yeah, and so you know he's he still got his ear to the wall. So I'm you know I'm still in touch with my dad, and I I kind of know what's going on, and and uh, you know so I mean that's how I stay in touch. But um, you know they're do they're very low key right now. You know they're not doing things. I mean they're doing the typical gambling stuff in the numbers business. And you know they'll they got some union involvement again. They're kind of getting it back after Giuliani took a lot away or led that charge. So very quietly, I'll, I'll tell you what's happening. When I was in that life, we had five families. We had 750 made guys, guys that actually took the oath, that comprised all five families. You had a bunch of associates, but those 750 guys. At that time, the FBI in New York had uh, 1,200 and some odd agents assigned to all five families. So they had a lot of agents around, a lot of law enforcement. Today, okay, same five families, there's less than 100 agents that are monitoring all five families. Because why? Now they're into terrorism and cyber you know, crime and all that kind of stuff. So what's happening now, I believe, is that the mob is building up again, slowly, quietly. You know, they kind of went, you know, underground a little bit. You don't hear about them as much. You don't read about it as much. But trust me, they're still there. These guys are very resourceful. You Italians, man. That's awesome. You Italians are always going to find a way. We have we have two massive... By the way, I took a 23andMe test. Uh, I, I always thought I was an Irish fella. 0.01% Italian. No big deal. No big deal. I feel pretty good about it. I'm a better chef all of a sudden. Uh, oh, that sounds good. Now, is that, on, is that on your father's side or your mother's side? I don't know who did it. Somebody way back, though, took a little trip to the boot, though. Okay. <laughs> Because, you know, in order, in order to be inducted in their family, your father has to be Italian. So is Mom that... could be of another descent, but your dad must be Italian. Okay, and that's how you can only become a made man, right? You can be an associate, but your, your father has to be Italian. That's correct. Huh, how about that? Uh, Mr. Francis, you mentioned you spent some time in prison. Were, did, were you treated any differently? Were, were they influenced at all, both the prisoners and the guards, by who you were? Well, I, got a, I drew a 10-year prison sentence. I spent eight years in prison. And uh, I did actually almost three years in solitary, they kept me. But, um, you know, I was in the federal system. And, uh, you know, I, I got to be honest, I had a lot of celebrity when I walked in. Everybody knew who I was because I had a lot of publicity. So, you know, among the inmates, you become a big guy because a couple of reasons. Number one, guys are trying to get close to you. They figure when they get out, maybe you become friends, you know, you make some money together. So they're always kind of trying to get close to you in that regard. And the guards, it could go either way. You can get some of them, you know, that just say, hey, you know, this is my prison. You're not running anything. And they can have that attitude with you. They resent you immediately. And then some that are really cool. I mean, I had some guards around me that, you know, did me a lot. I'll tell you something. It's funny. I had a guard around me. I was in Terminal Island, right? It was a pretty good prison. If you got to do prison, it was pretty good. It was, on the, uh, it was in San Pedro. It was right on the water. It was really great. Every Saturday... Pat, you'll laugh. Every Saturday, these uh, young women used to come by in their boats, right? And we used to be in a prison yard. They used to drive by in their boats and pull their, you know, their uh, yep. their bathing suit top down and thrill all the guys. And you saw a wave of guys running to the fence. You would have thought almost they were going to try to climb over and hit <laughs> but, but anyway, um, I had one guard that I was pretty close with, and he was in the commissary. So he comes to me, you know, and he used to do me a lot of favors in there. And he said, Mike, I'm in trouble. I'm going to get fired. I said, why? What happened? He said, my accounting is all off this month and I'm in real trouble. I said, well, were you stealing money? He said, no, nah, you know, I just messed up. I said, well, I can't lose you. You're a good guy in here. I said, you know, I got to keep you around. I said, let me think about this. So I said, OK, here's what you're going to do when you but you got to do this on a on a, uh, a night when we have no visiting because I don't want to lose my visiting. They're going to lock us down. He said, OK. So it was a Monday night because there's no visiting Tuesday, Wednesday, right? I said, Monday night, when you leave, leave the door unlocked. I said, I'm going to get one of the inmates with a sledgehammer. They're going to make like they broke the door open. They're going to go in there and they're going to steal everything in the commissary. 
I said, this way, next day you come in, you blame it on the inmates, you're clear. They'll lock us down for two days, and then it's all over. So he said, Mike, that's the greatest idea. <laughs> so the, the two inmates I got, I said, listen, don't bring any stuff to my cell. I said, go in there, get all your sneakers, everything you want, but don't bring anything to my cell because I don't want to get going a hole over this. And that was it. They locked us down for two days, and then it was cool. He kept his job, and that was great. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, such ingenuity by you, man. You, I, I feel like you're the type of guy, if they were to drop you in the middle of a, a desert or a jungle, you'd be able to figure out a way to thrive. I, I, honestly, I do believe that. Well, thank you, Pat. That's a good compliment. I, I don't know about that. You know, I just, uh, you know, you know what I found out, Pat? It's important to have good people around you. You know, you, n you never do this stuff alone. And, you know, I, I think even one of the reasons why I survived accountability in life is very important and i you know i've got people around me that hold me accountable my wife you know she won't stand for any nonsense from me she went through a lot with me eight years in prison you know death sentence all this kind of stuff so you know and i i just i try to surround myself with good people because really you know it's what i tell a lot of the student athletes you know you are who you hang with in this world and if uh you know if you hang with the wrong people you get influenced the wrong way or you influence them in the wrong way so I think I've just been very fortunate, you know, things just break my way, uh, you know, for all these years, and I'm grateful for it. Well, except for that 500 fucking pounder that turned on you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, every once in a while, what are you going to do? <laughs> Diggs, you got anything for him? No, 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 I right know. Hey, I want to yeah. let you know, I was oh, so Todd excited does. to chat with you. Todd, this guy was a, uh, he was 21 years state police, so Scumbag. big fan of yours. I <laughs> really? <laughs> Actually, yeah, well, you, you guys know, are pretty you cool. You know what, it's amazing, I have so many friends in law enforcement now that I've, you know, all over the country. You know, I, I spoke uh, a couple of weeks ago. I went back to Long Island. This was really, really a great experience. And um, I, I kind of stayed out of Long Island. That was kind of my headquarters. So I haven't gotten there that much. But I went back there. I spoke at a church. And in the, uh, in the church, the guys that came to hear me were two officers that uh, had arrested me. Oh. Wow. And, uh, and one court, uh, court uh, what do you call him, court official that, you know, when I was on trial, he was there in the courtroom. So the two officers came up to me and they said, man, you know, it's great to see you turned your life around. He said, you remember me? I said, no, I don't. He said, let me remind you. He said, when I was booking you and I was fingerprinting you, you had a, a gold diamond ring on and you left it on the side. And when we walked out of the room, you turned to me and said, hey, you stole my ring. Go get my ring back. Right? He said, no, I didn't steal it. I said, go steal it. I said, if you want, I'll give it to you, but don't steal it. He said, that's what you told me. <laughs> So uh, I said, let's go back in the room. And it was on the shelf over there. I said, oh, you're pretty cute. You were going to leave it over there and take it later. You thought I would forget, right? So we were laughing over it. But, you know, to see these guys, they're, they're all retired now. But to come full circle like that and see these guys, and it was really, it was, it was just a great experience, you know, meeting people like that. And they were happy for me, you know. They were glad you, you ended up here and not in prison forever. Hey, you're That's a success good. story, brother. Yeah. Todd, people are people. I, I read where you had you worked a project with Joe Pistone, who's the real life Donnie Brasco for TV yes. or something. Did that really happen? And if so, how'd you guys get along? Well, you know I mean after I left the life. Yeah. Yeah, he and I have spoken at a number of uh, security uh, events, you know, for uh -huh. actually for all the pro teams. And we were on a couple of panels together. And, uh, you know, Joe's a good guy. I mean, he, he really is. And, uh, you know, he actually wished me a happy Thanksgiving. I got a, a text from him. But we've been uh, we've probably been in each other's company about 10 times over the past several years. And, you know, I had met him on the street, too, because I oh, was really? pretty friendly with, uh, you know, with one of his guys. And, um I said to him, man, I'm glad I didn't do any business with you back then, Joe. He said, yeah, you're lucky you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So. Uh, the Donnie Brasco, obviously there's documentaries and movies about mm. that. The Sopranos, now The Irishman, where you said it's fabricated. Is there What is the most uh, lifelike movie or documentary or something like that about the La Cosa Nostra if we were to want to watch something? And what's the worst? What's the most fabricated thing you've ever seen about the life? Okay. Well, I'm going to tell you, my opinion, one of the best, most accurate movies. You're going to be surprised about this. Um, but but it just really factually, it was right on point. And that was the Gotti movie that was done by HBO many years ago with mm. Armand Asante playing Gotti. If you haven't seen it, go on YouTube and watch it. It was terrifically, Armand Asante just killed the role. He was great. Everybody was good. And it was very accurate. 
you know, they went from court records and uh, and wiretaps and all of that and got the information. It was a great movie. I loved it. And like I say, you can get on YouTube, I guess. Um, you know, the most, um, I think the most accurate um, was Goodfellas, quite honestly. Um, you know, and Donnie Brasco was pretty accurate. Now, there's some things that were fabricated in there also, but the general storyline on both of those movies was pretty on point. And I thought Pacino, you know, as Lefty Guns, he, he did a fabulous job. I thought it was one of his best acting jobs, really. He was great in, uh, in Donnie Brasco. And Goodfellas, I mean, for me, you know, Joe Pesci stole the show there. I mean, he was just uh, mm -hmm. he I don't was shine just great. shoes no more. <laughs> and it was fairly accurate, both of those movies. So I say, you know, those three would be on the top. The worst movie, absolute worst, was the recent Gotti movie. <laughs> <laughs> so Travolta so Easy. <laughs> oh, my. You know that that was the only movie I know of that got zero on Rotten Tomatoes? <laughs> Zero. And I felt bad because, you know, I, I know the Gotti family pretty well. And I said, man, you know, this it should have never been made. It was just terrible. Terrible. Uh, we got a guy from Canada in the back. He has a question for you. Sort of along the same lines. Um, you've done documentaries on Discovery, National Geographic and History Channel. Which one was kind of most realistic that you were in? You know, I think the... Um, I think the History Channel one was was pretty on point. I mean, you know, those those networks, they're, they're pretty good. I mean, they, they try to get it factually correct. I just did another one, and um, I'm just signing a deal with a big production company to do a television series. And um, hey! I'm pretty excited about it. Yeah. And right now, the, uh, the working title is Gas Wars. And what it's going to be is, is, like I said earlier, Pat, you know, the golden years of that life were from the 50s to the to the 80s and we're going to do it under the umbrella of the gas business because so many you know so many families were touched by it at that time and i'm real excited they put on a great writer and i think it's going to be a great series and you'll probably see it in about a year but uh, we're working on it now nice so um you know but those you know discovery channel history channel they they do a pretty good job in getting it right at least my experience with them has been that way if you need an Irish guy that's got 0.01% Italian, in it, <laughs> let me know. <laughs> uh, I was going to ask, what is your, so everyone has a nickname. What is the fav or your favorite nickname that you came across of, of your entire time in the Mafia? Oh, gosh, there's so many. You know, we weren't very original. You know, <laughs> you know like there was a guy, Benny Eggs. They called him Benny Eggs because he liked eggs. <laughs> <laughs> or creative. You know, there was another guy called Chicken Head. <laughs> and we called him Chicken Head because he used to uh, shoot the, the heads off of chickens. That's how he would practice his marksmanship. <laughs> so we called him Chicken Head. You know, I mean, look, you know, one of my favorite guys, I mean, you didn't call Fat Tony Fat Tony no. to his face. But, <laughs> but uh, you know, he, he was one of my favorite guys because he just, he was right out of central casting. I don't know if you've ever seen him. But, you know, he was, he was about five foot six. He was kind of on a heavy side, smoked a cigar, and wore a fedora, right? Right out of central casting. He really talked really gruff. You've seen him in the movie. Mm -hmm. It was portrayed pretty well. But I'll tell you a story. He called me one day. He was the boss of the Genovese family. He had a social club in Harlem. So he sent for me. I was a captain with the Columbos. But when a boss sends for you, you go, right? So I put it on record with my boss, and I go see Tony in his club. And, and he, uh, he's sitting out in front, and he says to me, Mike, i got to ask you a question. I said, what, Tony? He said, uh, what are you doing with this gas business? I hear you're doing pretty good. I said, yeah, Tony, I'm doing good. He said, you're making money? I said, yeah, Tony, no complaints. I'm doing good. He said, I got a favor to ask you. I said, hey, you're the boss. Anything you want. What could I do for you? He said, I got these five Mama Lukes around me. They can't earn five cents. All deadbeats. He said, I got to support them. I, I'm tired of seeing them. He said, you do me a favor. You give them a job? I said, yeah, Tony, I'll help you out. He said, what, what, what will they do? I said, well, look, I, I got a bunch of gas stations. How about I put them in charge of a gas station? They'll operate it for me. And I said, but Tony, don't let them rob me. You know how these guys are. I said, rob you? I'll cut off their hands, their arms, <laughs> just like that, right? I said, well, you don't, have, you don't have to do that. Just make sure they don't rob me, right? So he, uh, he says to me, that sounds good. He said, how much will they make? How much are you going to pay them? So now I'm thinking about it, right, Pat? I don't want to insult the boss, you know. I said, I, let me think about it. I said, Tony, how about I give them 1500 a week in cash each week? I said, will that work? He looks at me and he says, 1500 Give them 500 Give me the 1000 <laughs> <laughs>
I said, hey, Tony, you're the boss, whatever you want. And that's how we did. You know? I tell you, Pat, you make a lot of friends when you're making that kind of money, man. It, it, was, it was amazing. You know, that's, it helped me out a lot. You know, then I had a, a jet plane, guys needed to go someplace. I would fly them around. I had a helicopter. I drove the feds crazy. When I was on trial with Giuliani, right, I used to live out in Long Island. So I would get my helicopter in Garden City. It would take me 18 minutes to get in, right? So I'm in trial in Manhattan. And when we were ready to leave, the FBI agents are coming from Long Island. I say, hey, guys, you got a three and a half hour drive. To Why don't you jump in a helicopter? <laughs> I said, yeah, come on. I said, come on. It's not that expensive. I won't charge you. You know, they used to get mad at me. Here. No, we can't do that. You know? <laughs> what was your name? Money Mike? No, you know what? I hated my. I, first of all, nobody gave me a nickname on the street, but the media started calling me the Yuppie Don. And I hated, I hate that yuppie kind of thing, right? Yeah. It was like California style, you know, whatever. But it stuck. So guys started calling me yuppie. I said, hey, don't say that. You know, you're going to be in trouble now. But <laughs> anyway, yeah, that was the only nickname I had. You got anything? Mm. Hey, uh, I can't thank you enough for joining us. MichaelFranzese.com. What's on there? Your appearances and how they, people can book you? Yeah, I got all of that. And, you know, I just, uh, I did a, uh, I do a lot of podcasts and all. I did one with Mike Tyson the other day. That was classic, I got to tell you. And it just dropped yesterday, and it's been getting a lot of attention. But, I, you know, I'm on Instagram and, uh, and um, what do you call it, Facebook and Twitter, all that stuff. You know, you got to be on that when you do what I do. But, uh, yeah, people can tune in. And uh, Mike, I had a great interview with Mike. And I got to tell you, he's, he's turned, you know, he's so brutally honest. It's unbelievable. And he's really, he's turned his life around in a big way, you know, and I, I, I really enjoyed the interview I had. It was wild, don't get me wrong, because you know Mike, but we had a good time with it. Did you, did you guys ever get involved in boxing? I feel like the judges always have a chance to be persuaded. Big time into boxing, Mike. That was the sport, sport that we were really involved in. We owned fighters. You know, I don't want to mention names now, but we had a lot of influence in that sport. And yes, fights were fixed. Guys do take a dive at times. You know, it was... It was a sport, especially in the 40s and 50s, that was heavily manipulated by us. That much I can tell you. Do you kind of, all right, so with all the things that you know, like it's almost like learning that Santa Claus isn't real. Like is that kind of like your life now? You like, if you see something happen, you, you start thinking to yourself like, uh, maybe the 103-year-old dad is cooking up some shit here. You know what I mean? Like do you have that thought? Yeah, I'm always, you know, growing up the way I did and being involved, I'm always cynical. You know, I have a cynical eye on everything. You know, I try to give people the benefit of the doubt, but then that, you know, all mob stuff and mentality starts to creep in. I said, nah, this ain't right. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's got to make a living, Pat. You know, they got to do it one way or the other. <laughs> um, man, you were awesome. I can't thank you enough. I, I just, I, as soon as I heard you speak in West Virginia, I was... You had me, you had everybody captivated for the entire thing just because the mafia is this thing that very much existed in our world, but people that aren't involved in it are just so mind blown by the fact that it did, right? It's like, oh, these humans are living in the same world as us with the same laws as us, just getting around it and making a living, not just a living, a big time living, and then all the dangers of it. I mean, it's amazing. Not only what you accomplished in the mafia, by the way, you probably don't get congratulated for that much, but I just want to let you know, you should be happy with what you accomplished in there. And then turning your life around is an incredible story. I hope, uh, I hope a lot of people listening learn of the man that is Mike Francis because you're a, you're a legend, sir. Well, listen, I appreciate that, Pat. And, um, you know, again, to me, I've just been very, very fortunate because it certainly could have went the other way for me. And, you know, I'm thankful on a daily basis. And, and I will tell you this. You know, I'm amazed when you're part of that life, you don't you don't think that there's so much intrigue from people outside of it. But when I got outside and started talking about it, I mean, I'm amazed at the fascination of this life all over the world. I mean, do you know that the biggest movie ever in China was The Godfather? Hmm. Number one movie in China. I didn't know that. And I went to Singapore. I spoke at a big event in Singapore. It was a ticketed event. And when we opened it up, we had 1,800 people there. When we opened it up for questions... I was amazed that I was there for two and a half hours answering questions about the, the, the life, about Gotti, about all the movies, the Paul Castellano murder. And, you know, they asked me in Singapore if I knew where Jimmy Hoffa was buried. In Singapore. <laughs> do, do you? Do you? Uh, well, you know, I mean, I, look, I, I can tell you <laughs> You know, I, I, I can tell you this. Um, 
that movie was fabricated. <laughs> and I, I don't I don't know if the truth will ever come out, but you know, look, he got he disappeared in seventy five. That was right through my time. I, I, I can tell you that the order came down from New York and there was talk about it, you know, way back when and 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 I think I know, you know, better than most what really went down there. But I'll leave it at that. I, I'm not joining the Hoffa train where every other you know week somebody comes out. I know where the body is and all this kind of stuff. Uh, I doubt they're ever going to find his body. I can tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, MichaelFrancis.com, WiseGuysWisdom.com. Turn his entire life around. Great coach, inspirational man. Hire him to talk at your whatever it is. You're captivating, and I can't thank you enough. Ladies and gentlemen, Michael Francis. <laughs> Well, same here, Pat. Thanks a lot for having me on. I heard, you know, so many great things about the show, and I can see it, you know. So uh, I'm glad you've uh, you've gone down this road, and things look great for you, too. So it's all good. I'm going to book you to come talk in here, man. Just because, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I absolutely, I'm so intrigued by the entire thing. Because of, I grew up around all Italian, literally mm. all Italians. DeGilio, Moraldo, Impavito, Peronio, uh, Master Giacomo, Dallas Salad. These are all my friends. Like where I grew up, so I'm literally all Italian. So the entire thought of the mob has been literally something that I've been intrigued by since I was a child. So it's like really cool. Well, where's your studio? Indianapolis. Oh, Indianapolis. Okay. You know, I um, I go to Chicago quite a bit, and I Thank actually God. have uh, a close relationship uh, in Chesterton, Indiana, which is um, not too far from me. I think it's about a two hour drive from Indianapolis. So I go there quite a bit. Maybe we'll connect. Oh, I would love That'd to. Be awesome. I uh, would be very honored. I'm very thankful you came on, man. Appreciate it. Thank hey, you and thanks much. for holding the iPhone, by the way, here for <laughs> 47 <laughs> minutes. Your forearms must be, I mean, burning. No, well, they're not like yours, I can tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, my wife just gave me this gadget to put on the back of the phone so it's easy oh, to yeah. hold. Oh, the little yeah. the button thing. Yeah. Hey, yeah, now your wife, cool. your wife was a, is a famous lady as well, right? My wife's great, man. You know, listen, if it wasn't for her, I'd either be dead or in prison for the rest of my life. No doubt about it. So she, uh, you know, she deserves any credit for getting me on the straight and narrow. That's for sure. And she keeps me that way, too. But, uh, yeah, I mean, she's uh, she's terrific, you know, and she's kind of low key. You know, I'm the guy out there doing the stuff and she kind of just keeps me straight in the background. Whenever you said you were going to go straight or whatever, I wonder she had to be so scared for you, I'd assume. Well, she was, you know, because the feds told her, I mean, when I was out on parole, the feds told her that, you know, it's only a matter of time. I was going to get killed. I mean, every time I walked out the door, Pat, literally, we didn't have cell phones back then. We had beepers. She used to beat me like five, six times. I had to run to a pay phone and tell her I was all right. I mean, they really scared her. They really did. So for, you know, in my house now, I'm telling you this. I have five daughters. I got two boys. I got, you know, the whole bit. In my house now, when that if the doorbell rings early in the morning nobody will answer it because they figure i'm going to get arrested or something's going to go wrong <laughs> now, this is 20 20 some odd years later they they get afraid when the doorbell rings i mean that's how much of an impression that stuff made on them in the irishman i know it's fabricated but when uh joe was uh, about to turn on the car when all those car mm -hmm. bombings were happening, there was a moment there where I was like, oh, I didn't even think about it. every single time you turn your car on, you have to think like, oh, shit, this thing could blow up right in my face right now. I mean, that's, you guys were yeah. savages back in the day. Huh? It was absolute savages. Yeah, no, no doubt about it. I mean, look, you had, you had to be, to survive in that life, you had to be on the alert pretty much all the time. Did you wear and suits every day? What's that? Did you wear suits every day? I did, yeah. It was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look, and, and my weekends, Pat, my weekends were weddings and funerals. Mm -hmm. And half the time, I didn't know who was getting married or who died. But we had to go because, you know, respect. You got 750 made guys and somebody's always dying or getting married. <clears throat> and so you had about a respect. You know, we went with our guys. We got a table. We gave an envelope. And if it was a funeral, we went there, paid our respects. There was times when I went to two, three weddings, two funerals in a weekend. It was it was like part of our life. Oh, jeez. Did you dance on that dance floor? Or? <laughs> no. <laughs> I didn't do that. Just get the envelope. That was it. Hey, we're here. Thank you so much. Good luck. Have a good one. That's Appreciate it, Pat. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much. Michael. You're amazing, man.